Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Richard Cash, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and I'm going to take and use this session to talk about taking science to the people or the development dissemination of oral rehydration therapy, this particular health intervention, and hope that uh, you can gather lessons from this that are highly relevant, I believe, in today's world, even though this story begins well over 50 years ago. So to begin with, this is a child who is severely dehydrated. That is, he's lost a lot of fluid because of diarrheal disease. Diarrhea could be caused by cholera or a pathogen such as E. coli, rotavirus, and so on. And you can see he has a sort of apathetic look on his face. He'd be breathing rapidly because he's acidotic. Uh, his uh, mouth might be dry. His pulse would be rapid. His blood pressure might be low. Uh, he would have a very low urine output. He's dehydrated. You might think of a plum becoming a prune or a grape becoming a raisin. Here's a, another child, very young child, and you'll see the fontanelle or the soft spot on the top of the head, which is often seen, which is uh, found in uh, newborns. And it's sunken because again, he is very dehydrated and lost a lot of fluid. Now, when uh, uh, the story of the development uh, begins, uh, this is a uh, slide looking at the percentage of children in the world who are dying of diarrheal disease. And uh, estimated, this was in 1965 or 66, that there were 14 million children dying of, uh, of uh, mostly infectious diseases. You can see that almost 30% of these were from diarrheal disease. That's the green section there. Uh, much of this story is in, takes place in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a uh, low-lying country. It's uh, surrounded uh, mostly by India uh, on the eastern, it's on the eastern side of South Asia. And there's a small part of it that is also touches on Burma. It's a flat land uh, about the size of uh, the state of Wisconsin, which I believe has something like three and a half million people. Bangladesh has uh, today uh, 160 million. At the time, it was about 60 million people. Um, and uh, it is, uh, uh, there are large rivers, the Ganges coming in from the west and the Brahmaputra coming in from the north. And so it's a deltic area, much like the Mississippi Delta or the Mekong Delta or the Nile Delta before engineers got a hold of uh, putting in dams and so on. And at the time, uh, again, this is the uh, mid late sixties, people got around in boats. These are some larger boats uh, right out of the middle ages uh, that uh, uh, there was not motorized uh, uh, transport then. Today, of course, this has changed dramatically. Uh, people came into the hospital uh, with their children, uh, often by country boat. And so you can imagine that to that to what would take us five or 10 minutes by car, that might take uh, two or three hours by boat. And so people were reluctant to come into hospitals, uh, even though the children might have diarrhea, because to come into the hospital, to go back, uh, might well take a day. And it was not even certain that there would be doctors or nurses available. They might also come in by the local ambulance, and that's what this is, a woman is being transported. And you can imagine trying to carry her across uh, a bridge such as this. And so getting into uh, to receive care was oftentimes very difficult. In the city, patients would often come in by bicycle rickshaw. Again, our, it, it might take a very long period of time to go from a slum area uh, of the city into a, a treatment center. Now, what was the treatment center? Where uh, in the summer times, and this was true in the U.S. at the turn of the uh, beginning of the 20th century, bed after bed of children who are having diarrhea is seen in this particular hospital. You can see with a lot of IV bottles there, IV is intravenous fluid, uh, and this would be given by a needle and tubing into the child to restore the dehydration that had occurred. That is to try to get fluid into the child to replace that which had been lost 
through diarrhea. The most severe of all of the diarrheas is cholera, and cholera produces a huge volume of uh, liquid stool. This is a, a gentleman who took 100 liters to uh, uh, fully treat and restore him. Uh, he fully recovered, uh, but this would have required three or four months of salary, even if this intravenous fluid was available, which it wasn't for most of the rural areas. So what people were looking for was a diarrhea treatment that could be inexpensive because people were making $200 a year, easy to use, deliverable by non-professionals because there were no doctors or nurses in rural areas. It had to be physiologically sound, of course, and effective. And of course, it also had to be acceptable to the population. If they wouldn't accept it, it would not be used. This is a schematic uh, uh, drawing of uh, how the oral therapy works. If you look at those two lines there, that represents the uh, walls of the intestine. Intestine is a long hollow tube going from the stomach all the way down to the anus. And diarrhea is developing in the upper small intestine the jejunum and the ileum. If you give a patient a isotonic solution, that is a solution that contains all the electrolytes of the stool, sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, and water, of course, uh, diarrhea actually worsens. However, if you add glucose to this mix, and glucose is uh, table sugar, uh, is a mix of fructose or honey, uh, and uh, glucose. The glucose uh, allows the passage of the isotonic salts and water and hydration is maintained or corrected. The original uh, ORS, oral rehydration solution, uh, recommended by WHO, uh, consists of the following. Sodium chloride, which is table salt, soda bicarbonate, bicarbonate of soda, potassium chloride, you can find potassium in bananas and uh, tomatoes and citrus fruits and so on, and glucose. And you can see the millimole uh, equivalent of sodium chloride, potassium bicarbonate, and glucose in this solution. Now, uh, this is a picture of a cholera cot. A cholera cot is a wonderful a piece of appropriate technology. It is simply a juke cot which can be folded up and you can see the blue uh, plastic sheet that covers it. And about where the buttocks is, uh, uh, there's a hole in the cot. And this plastic sheet uh, covers the bed and the uh, plastic sleeve goes into a translucent bucket. The individual is pouring out a lot of uh, diarrheal stool and it goes into the bucket. And the whole principle of the treatment of diarrheal disease is input and output. That is, whatever the individual has lost, that is replaced with the oral solution uh, as quickly as possible. And how do we know whether this person is well hydrated? Well, generally, of course, they'll be passing urine. The urine will be of a light yellow color. And this indicates, along with the blood pressure and, and uh, pulse and so on, that the individual is hydrated. This person came in just recently and uh, is giving getting his uh, uh, fluid by uh, intravenous route. Now, let me show you the effectiveness of oral rehydration solution. Uh, here is a woman who's severely dehydrated. Uh, you can see again, the eyes seem to be sunken. She would be breathing rapidly uh, and deeply. She would have a uh, rapid or unattainable pulse. You can see her here that the skin turgor, that is the skin on her abdomen is tented up if you pick up the skin on the back of your hand and you release it, it will go back to its normal status. But if you're severely dehydrated, the tenting will re remain. So here she is, and she's receiving an oral uh, solution. She must be alert because if she is in any, if her, uh, if she's uh, not alert, if she's not uh, awake, she could aspirate this, and it would go into her lungs. And here she is, uh, some twelve. 18 hours later. Compare this with this. 
uh, it's almost like Lazarus arising from the dead, so to speak. This is the basic principle. Uh, that plant that you left uh, before you went on holiday and you come back and you are able to restore it. It turns out that using the oral rehydration solution, we could save up to 80% of the intravenous fluid that was necessary. In other words, 10 liters, that would be the amount usually used to uh, treat an adult patient, could now be used to treat five patients rather than simply one. So you could spread out the uh, availability of the oral of the uh, intravenous solution, which had to be given if somebody came in in shock. Now, as part of the whole treatment of diarrhea, we also recommended that children never stop their breastfeeding uh, because that was essential. You couldn't starve children and that mothers would continue feeding their children just as we would want to eat if we were uh, hungry. And so the whole package, oral rehydration solution, feeding, care of the, of the uh, diarrhea patient is called oral rehydration therapy, ORT. Here's a little girl who's been admitted uh, to the hospital, again, uh, severely dehydrated. In this case, her mother is involved in the uh, care of her uh, daughter because uh, this is very important. Uh, first of all, the, the young, uh, the, the child uh, is, feels much more comfortable uh, with their mother. And secondly, uh, there will be other episodes of diarrhea at home. And uh, uh, the mother is learning here how to, in fact, uh, uh, use this method uh, for her child. And here's the little girl, again, uh, 12, uh, 18 hours later. Uh, and you can compare here to here. Again, it's a remarkable uh, uh, return to a state of hydration, which can occur within a few hours, actually. One of the earliest tests of the use of this on a large scale was during the Bangladesh War of Liberation, when 10 million refugees streamed across the border into India. This was just one of the refugee camps. It's an area called Salt Lake near Calcutta. And here they were uh, uh, about to put in uh, sewage pipes uh, as these refugees streamed across. And many of them actually used the pipes to uh, set up a house. Now, whenever you have large numbers of people coming together, uh, diarrhea always remains a significant problem because water and sanitation are hard to manage. You know that if you go to rock concerts or any large gatherings, there will be portable toilets uh, put on site to uh, allow people to uh, use that and uh, also wash their hands. Uh, this was not present when these uh, millions of refugees streamed across and diarrhea became a problem. In fact, it broke out in this camp. Here is an example of someone actually filling up a bottle with ORS uh, uh, and will take it back to the home and mortality was reduced down to less than 3%. Now, in the best of circumstances, uh, mortality from cholera can be less than half a percent, should be less than half a percent. In fact, if someone comes into a hospital uh, and they're alive, they should uh, walk out of the hospital uh, as well. Now, once they demonstrated that the oral rehydration solution, and I'll now refer to all of this as ORT, uh, was effective, the next uh, uh, movement was to try to get this into the homes themselves, because that's where people were having diarrhea. And that's uh, where, uh, as I showed you in the early uh, slides, oftentimes uh, movement towards the treatment center were limited. So here are some examples of early packets that were put together of the various salts. And here is a school teacher who's distributing packets that had been produced by UNICEF into the uh, village homes. Uh, the problem was that you still had to get the packets to him. And secondly, and a major stumbling block was the size of the container because the salts are to be dissolved in a particular volume, in this case, one liter. Now someone said, let's try to get past the packets by using certain number of spoons of 
salt and sugar and uh, bicarbonate and so on. However, again, we're talking the late 60s here in Bangladesh when people went out into the community, they found either that there weren't spoons or there were spoons of very different sizes. And, uh, and so to standardize would become difficult. So the suggestion was made, well, why don't we make some spoons? And here's one example of it, where salt is on one end and this is sugar on the other end, uh, and it would be dissolved in a set volume of water. The problem, of course, with this is that uh, the directions are written down, but uh, these, uh, the literacy rate uh, at this time in Bangladesh for women was less than 5%. And you still need to have a speci specific volume. Uh, again, dealing with the volume issue, uh, this is a picture from Nicaragua. And uh, what is the correct volume here for a liter? Is it the Pepsi bottle? Is it the uh, whiskey bottle? Is it the, uh, is it the canteen? Uh, what is the correct amount? And uh, also the, the glasses at the home and the, and the uh, different size spoons is another example of where there was no standardization. Well, one could uh, have made a standard container, as you see here, and used a standard packet. The dilemma was you had to distribute it and you had to make it. And this would, uh, it's, and it would still require some degree of, uh, of instruction uh, and would greatly increase the cost. So again, people are trying to figure out how can we actually uh, get this into the hands of people so that they can produce it in their homes? Well, there was a, uh, there's an NGO called BRAC, B-R-A-C, which actually turns out is the world's largest uh, NGO and, uh, uh, and ranked number one. Uh, and I've worked with them for many years. And the director uh, of them at the time, Sir Fosley Abbott, who since passed away, uh, worked out that if you took a pinch of salt and a scoop of sugar, uh, in this case, in the case of Bangladesh, it would be something called gur or uh, uh, raw sugar, which also contains potassium. And if you added that to a half a liter of water, you could get an oral solution that would be very effective early on in the, uh, would have the, the uh, the electrolyte content and could be used early on in the course of diarrhea uh, to hopefully prevent the severe uh, dehydration that we saw in the first two cases. So I'm going to describe their program now so you get a sense of, again, taking the science to the people. So they trained a group of young women who would go from house to house uh, in a community. They'd be housed at a community uh, centers such as this, and they would see about 10 women a day and give the message to them. They went from 17 points down to 10 points, down to seven points. So they're teaching the women seven points to remember what is diarrhea, what's the cause, how to treat it, how to make the oral, uh, or oral solution. And they would come to a village and they would see uh, the women and children there uh, the men would often be off working in the fields. And here is a worker here in the green sari, and she's teaching a mother how to prepare the solution. Now, how did they get around this problem of the volume? Well, you see the worker has a cup there. It's about a half a liter cup. And she asks the mother to bring out a pan or some container she will have in the house. She then... Uh, uh, fills the cup, pours it into the pan, and scratches uh, a mark on the pan so that the mother now has a permanent half a liter container. You notice the child is sleeping there. Uh, uh, this is very important because trying to teach people in a crowded outpatient apartment would oftentimes be very difficult. Children are crying, screaming, mothers uh, are hard. It's hard put for them to concentrate on what is going on. Here, uh, she's also teaching the mother how to use a pinch of, uh, uh, of salt and then a scoop of sugar to make up the solution. And the mother will also then uh, taste it so that she knows what exactly it tastes like uh, and uh, uh, is fully uh, aware of 
both the seven points and how to make up the solution. Uh, later on, they discovered that they could actually teach uh, four mothers uh, at the same time, uh, which uh, in increased their efficiency. But what's also very important to note is all the children who are sitting there uh, and listening, because these children who in today's world would now all be in school uh, are picking up the message and they learn much quicker than the adults. This is uh, reinforced with a, uh, a flip chart uh, showing uh, different uh, uh, stages in the process of the treatment of diarrhea. And there were posters that were uh, put out in the village also to reinforce the idea, the pinch, the scoop, the uh, preparation, the giving, the foods, and so on. It was also uh, uh, recognized by the field workers because they were the ones who were going to uh, implement the program and who were being paid by the program that it would be helpful to also inform the men in the community because oftentimes they would uh, uh, make the decision as to what treatment should be given. And here the doctor in the blue is, uh, uh, is talking to some of the men in the marketplace. Now, a very unique uh, element of this program was how they evaluated the effectiveness of this. Uh, and they demonstrated that uh, if they took a sample of the uh, uh, mothers who had been taught by a particular worker, let's say the worker had worked for 30 days and seen 10 people a day, that would be 300 people, that evaluator, the young man, would take a sample survey of 30 of these, 10%. And he'd go to the woman and he would ask her the seven points. If she could uh, recite the uh, seven, six or seven points and could prepare the solution, you can see the gores in the brownish uh, uh, container there, then uh, it would be recorded as an A in the book. Four or five would be a B, two or three would be recorded as a C. Uh, and the worker was then paid, we'll just give a hypothetical number here, five cents for an A, three cents for a B, uh, two cents for a C. If the mother could not prepare the solution, it was recorded as a negative. The worker is then paid on a pro rata basis. So that if let's say 90% of the 300 got an A, it would be 0.9 times 300 times five cents and so on. So uh, at the end of the day, you want to maximize the uh, uh, salaries that you give out because that means that mothers are learning. And the uh, uh, feeling was that if mothers knew how to use it, they would use it uh, because they would be uh, practicing the very thing that they had learned. Uh, and it turns out that uh, as the months went by, uh, they began to see fewer patients coming into the, uh, with diarrhea coming into the outpatient department and they were uh, less dehydrated. They also demonstrated that they could use the rice uh, water that came after cooking rice as another substitute for glucose. Now, what did this program uh, eventually demonstrate? Over a 10 year period from 1980 to 1990, over 12 million mothers were taught in their home to prepare the ORS solution. The knowledge was transmitted to mothers in the community by a female OTEP, that is the oral therapy extension program worker, whose salary was based on what the mothers learned, uh, which was basically seven points uh, with a combined active demonstration. How effective has it been over the years? Well, the knowledge has persisted in this population. And so the children born uh, well after their mothers had been seen uh, uh, knew about this solution. There was also jingles that were done, uh, uh, radio spots and so on. Bangladesh today has the highest use rate of oral rehydration solution and the use of, of oral re rehydration therapy, ORT. So what are the lessons that we learned? Well, it's important to secure professional and political commitment because if you don't, they can impede the message that you're trying to give. Uh, you need to take research to the people and learn from them to pr pr promote 
evidence-based intervention. This uh, development of ORS was based on some very, very uh, uh, excellent physiologic studies that have been done at, uh, in the United States, Harvard, and other institutions that showed that, that, uh, that glucose could enhance the transport of electrolytes across the semipermeable membrane. The in, original investigators did not fully understand the meaning and the application of this because they were not in, in embedded in a situation where the development of oral rehydration solution, oral rehydration therapy was so important. This also taking research to the people helped us to overcome the no-do gap. We, know, we knew what worked, we now had to do it. It also opens the opportunities for, for what has been called translational research. That is translating basic science into something that was that high, had high application. The context determines how success is measured. In this case, uh, there were essentially no options uh, but to use an oral solution. And so success was measured on how effective this was. Uh, it's clear that a intervention that reaches a high percentage of people is far preferable to a perfect solution which reaches a very small number. Reaching 80% with something that's 80% effective is far more important than reaching 10% uh, with something that's 100% effective. So uh, that said, however, that ORT is, is just as effective almost as uh, intravenous fluid is uh, in uh, many situations. So low cost, acceptable, attainable, and sustainable interventions are often better than those that are more high tech. And let me close with just a few thoughts. Uh, many of you have probably heard these. The first is by Louis Pasteur, the great French uh, uh, bacteriologist, microbiologist, who said that chance favors the prepared mind. That is, if you are uh, learning science here or at school or in other uh, situations, when the opportunity arises for to you to use that, you are more likely to understand what needs to be done because your previous training has prepared you. The second is from the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. You cannot step in the same river twice. You step in, you step out, you step in again, it's a different river. And this is important because in taking science to the people, the situation is constantly changing. That is, you are making observations as you go and you must adapt to those changes as things take place. And lastly, from Albert Einstein, everything should be as simple as possible, but not one bit simpler. And I think this is very important. And we have learned a lot of these lessons again during this whole pandemic situation that uh, because of previous research, we were able to develop a vaccine very early. The situation has constantly changed in terms of uh, who is infected, how uh, they respond to the infection, new variants and so on. And as we have continued to refine our methods, we are developing simpler interventions as we go. So I think many of the lessons that we learned from the ORT story uh, is highly relevant, was highly relevant then, and is highly relevant today. So thank you very much.